Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Sarah Scott. Uh, on behalf of the Centre for Hellenic Studies and Cosmos Society, introducing this open house, online open house broadcast. And our usual host uh, is this uh, guest this time. That's Keith Stone. Welcome, Keith. Thank you. Uh, and uh, just to uh, set, fill in our viewers a little bit about, uh, about you, uh, you're a CHS fellow in instructional design, uh, comparative study of ancient texts and research publications. Uh, you're also primary editor of Classical Inquiries and head teaching fellow of the Harvard College course Culture and Belief 22, that's the ancient Greek hero. Uh, and your uh, dissertation was Singing Moses' Song, uh, performance critical analysis of Deuteronomy's Song of Moses, and it's uh, been published uh, by the ILEX Foundation. And uh, you seem to have a broad range of interest, performance in traditional settings, uh, particularly founders, uh, also Northwest Semitic languages and inscriptions, land ideology, and ancient Greek, Greek myth and hero cult. Uh, so that, that's quite a broad range of uh, subjects, Keith. What, what, Kind of drew you to those in the first place well that's an aspirational list to some extent uh, so I, I mean i have a little bit of experience in all of those um the first one especially and the last one since i've been teaching with greg um the heroes course for such a long time um i thought i should throw that in at least at the end um what drew me to these topics um i mean first is my my interest in bible um, which came about because I grew up in a religious way and I heard sermons that puzzled me to some extent. The question in my mind was, well, how do we get from this text to this interpretation? Um, and so eventually I, I went on to study the Bible and, and that involved Greek. Um, and then in graduate school, I started working with Greg and started teaching with him. And that has brought me to the hero part of that and and to this community. Um, Deuteronomy has a lot to do with land ideology. So that's um, that's the connection. And also um, founders, traditions um, to do with founders. Moses is a you know, the primary figure in the background. He's the kind of font from which a lot of things flow in biblical literature. So that's a bit of orientation. Okay. okay, well, thank you for that, for that uh, introduction, Keith. Um, so uh, your topic this time is uh, Song of Moses, Song of Deuteronomy. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the, the evolution of the text. Um, so uh, I'll hand over to you to uh, fill us in on, on, on your subject. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, Song of Moses, Song of Deuteronomy, that's the title also of the, the talk that I'll be giving at the Society of Biblical Literature annual meeting in a month. This is kind of a dry run with parts of the argument. Um, and the point of the title is that the Song of Moses is not just a text appended to the end of the book, which is the way that it's usually viewed. Um, kind of as, well, an appendix. This, is, this happens in other biblical books as well. In Genesis, there's the famous blessing of Jacob, where he blesses his 12 sons. Um, it is woven into the narrative, so it's not totally disconnected. Or, let's see, at the end of the Samuel books, um, David's last words, you got to get it in, so you didn't, you didn't do it sooner, so it's at the end. Um, and there's another poem at the end of Deuteronomy, even after the Song of Moses, which does seem pretty um, random, you could say. Um, it doesn't really have much to do with the themes of the book. Um, but the Song of Moses does, which is an argument that needs to be made, I think, because people haven't made it before. And um, simply put, my argument is that the Song of Moses has been around in the, the hearts and minds, I guess, of the composers of Deuteronomy the whole time. And that you can see um, marks of this all throughout the book, even in the oldest parts. So I'm going to start presenting my slides here. Just a second. 
Okay, so I hope that you can see, that's my title slide. And, all right, gone over the title. So here's the book of Deuteronomy in a list with all the verses, all the chapters and verses. And you can see towards the bottom, um, in red, the verses of the Song of Moses, 43 of them. Quick orientation. So what is what is Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy? It's the, oh, that slide's actually a little too soon. It's the fifth of the five classic books of the Bible, the, the fifth of the five that make up the Torah, um, the, the law to go along with the prophets and the writings. Um, and it is um, well known in Christian circles, in the Christian realms, because it is, for example, the book from which Jesus draws when he is being tempted in the desert. Each time he answers the diabolical one, it's with a verse from Deuteronomy. So here is the version from Matthew 4. Jesus is being tempted um, with the words, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus answers with Deuteronomy. One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he could have included the citation. Not that he needed to. And so every single time, do not put the Lord your God to the test. It's from Deuteronomy. Um, he refuses to worship the devil because Deuteronomy says worship only the Lord your God. And it also figures in, in the episode of what is the greatest commandment? That is also from Deuteronomy. A lawyer of the, of the Pharisees asks him, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in, in the law? And Jesus' answer is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And that's also from Deuteronomy. The second one, which is like it, it's not bad, but it's from Leviticus. So. Okay, so the composition of Deuteronomy, it's a thorny question. Um, there are different theories, and um, let's see if I can give you a quick introduction to them. Um, so here's, here's our map, so to speak, of Deuteronomy again with the Song of Moses at the bottom. And for reference, up towards the top in line five, um, chapter five, there's the Ten Commandments, those red verses, verses five through 21. And down towards the bottom again, in 33, there's the other poem stuck onto the end of Deuteronomy, the blessing of Moses, rather than the song of Moses. And then in the middle is this big code of laws, um, chapters 12 through 26. And it's, it's a summary and it's a reinterpretation of earlier laws. And there's a big question about whether this law is meant to replace the earlier version or versions because it's contradictory in some ways. For example, can you sacrifice um, in where, uh, whatever town you live in or only in Jerusalem? Deuteronomy says only in Jerusalem, whereas the earlier law allows it anywhere else. So are these incompatible or is this seen as a faithful kind of continuation or development of the earlier law? But here are, here are some of the classic texts that have been plugged into Deuteronomy, so to speak, or around which the rest of Deuteronomy has been written. Um, okay, so what's changed in this next slide is that towards the bottom, just before the Song of Moses, um, I added these verses in blue. This is the introduction to the song, the little frame that goes around it. Um, and everyone pretty much agrees that those verses belong with the song. But most people don't appreciate, I would say, how other parts of the book of Deuteronomy go along with the song just as, just as much. Um, okay, in this slide, I've added the first three chapters in green. One of the theories goes that the book of Deuteronomy is the introduction to a longer historical work that goes the whole way through the book of Kings. Um, from here, the entrance to the land, which is where Deuteronomy starts, um, the whole way to, you know, through the kingdom of, of Israel and Judah, 
and its destruction by the Babylonians, by the Assyrians first and then the Babylonians. Um, and these three chapters were added on to the beginning of what was Deuteronomy in order to set the stage for this whole historical arc. And then there was reason for more kind of introduction and framing. You can see that around chapters four and 29 and 30, there's a bit more I put that I put in blue. That would be a second edition of this historical work. The first edition was kind of optimistic and showed how things haven't always been so great, but now we have a king that will follow the law of God and this will bring a blessing. But then there was disaster. So the thing had to be revised. And these parts in blue explain how that could happen. But there are other, other theories about the composition of Deuteronomy. That there are different kinds of framing devices around the whole thing. So the first three chapters might not be a, an introduction to a, a larger historical work, but they do have things in common with chapters at the very end, 31 through 34. And I left the song highlighted in red because it's what we're talking about. Or chapter four, and chapters 29 and 30 have things in common, or five and those same chapters, or six through 11, which is a little, very long introduction to the law that's coming up. And the, the very last kind of chapter of the law, which is transitional. Um, and so, and so it goes. Um, but so how can the song of Moses help us better understand the composition of Deuteronomy? There are three ways that I'll talk about. Um, um, three kinds of themes or mm, kinds of phrasing that I think you can spot several other places in Deuteronomy um, that show that the themes of, of the Song of Moses, the theological themes were really on the minds of the, of the composers of Deuteronomy. And also I've included a kind of playful example where there's some wording borrowed from the song, but not necessarily it's, it's theological content. It's, it's as if just this kind of phrasing or the rhythm was you know, present, it's, you know, it's a classic song and people knew it. And so in some cases they just tried to imitate it because it flowed naturally off the tongue or the pen, so to speak. But the first one is a theme, theological theme, satiation and apostasy. Here are a couple of verses from the song where there's a critical moment when the Israelites have um, partaken of the blessings that God has given them, this rich land with all kinds of food that are described here, um, honey and oil, all kinds of dairy products, um, wheat, wine. But then there's a problem. This, this moment of being satisfied is what leads to um, forgetting about, about God the God that brought the Israelites into the land, their own kind of personal or national God, goes by the name Yahweh. Um, and this is, well, here's the, here's the critical moment in, in green. Yeshurun is another name for, for Israel. It's kind of sarcastic because it probably means the, the upright or the just one. But in this case, Israel is not doing such a great job. Um, Yeshurun grew fat and kicked the perspective changes here. You grew fat, you became thick, you were overfed. He forsook the God who made him and scorned the rock of his salvation. This is clearly a problem in the theological world of Deuteronomy. And it's reflected in the frame, the kind of very near frame that I highlighted earlier in blue. Um, this is a couple of verses before the song in its introduction. Yahweh is talking to Moses, and he says, write this song for yourselves and teach it to the Israelites. Set it in their mouth in order that this song may be my witness against the Israelites when I bring them into the land that I swore to their ancestors. And here, here the parallel starts. The land that is flowing with milk and honey. And they eat and, and get full and fat and they face toward other gods. It's a very little translation of what's happening here. They turn towards other, other gods and serve them and they scorn me and violate my covenant. 
But it's not only in the undisputed frame of the song this theme appears. Oh, here they are together. Also in, in chapter six, which is one of the, considered to be one of the earlier parts, um, very early version of an introduction to the law code in the middle. Um, there's this whole sermon on coming into the land and how to behave there. And here are in green, the commonalities with the wording in the song. Um, so when you eat and are satisfied, then watch yourself that you do not forget Yahweh. For it's Yahweh, your God, whom you shall fear, and whom you, whom you shall worship, and by whose name you shall swear, you shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of evils around you. Again in chapter 8, and I should say, there's this, I guess I've already said it, there's an enormous amount of preaching in Deuteronomy that's very repetitious. Um, this is Moses on the edge of the land. I should have placed the, the book in its narrative setting. The Israelites have had their adventures. They've been created early on with Abraham, the choosing of Abraham and his family, and they go to Egypt and they become numerous and are oppressed by the Egyptians. And Yahweh rescues them, brings them out through the sea and drowns the Egyptian army in the sea. And they go through the desert and they have to stay there because they haven't been very faithful to their God. And so there's a punishment of wandering for 40 years in circles, um, even though they're very near to the land, to their destination. But eventually that's, um, that has reached its term and they're about to enter the land, finally, that was promised to them um, by Yahweh. And so Moses, who in these wilderness adventures has um, disqualified himself for entering the land. He says, okay, here, here's a recap of what's important. Here's the law that I um, gave to you from God at Mount Sinai. Um, and this is the opportunity for Deuteronomy to reinterpret the law, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then a lot of exhortation on the part of Moses. Um, to, to be obedient and do a good job so that there's no more, say, wandering in the wilderness or that kind of thing. So here's a sermon in chapter eight, which is the current slide, where there's kind of a very similar um, thing um, to what we saw in chapter six. In green here, when you have eaten and are satisfied, you should watch yourself. So you do not forget Yahweh your God, you should watch yourself lest you eat and become satisfied and you forget Yahweh your God. And if you do ever forget Yahweh your God and go after other gods, and that's the danger that is in the song, um, and serve them and bow out to them, then bad things will happen. Oh, here they all are conveniently put together. And then in chapter 11 as well, and this comes right before the law code starts. So it's clearly a very important theme. Um, again, there at the end, you will eat and be satisfied. Beware um, that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them. And I should say that this connection of being satisfied after eating and being fat or um, otherwise benefiting, I suppose, from, from food is not present elsewhere in the Bible, particularly. Um, in Jeremiah, there's a connection, but Jeremiah is a book that draws very heavily on the book of Deuteronomy, or there's even some debate about whether he contributed to its, its writing. Um, but really nowhere else is this kind of moralizing um, present. And we have this own kind of thing in our culture too, unfortunately. Um, it's really unfortunate that being satisfied is something that should be a problem but it is. Um, so it's, it's relatively unique. And I think that the presence of this theme in a couple of important sermons in the earliest parts of the book, um, that's one piece of evidence that shows that the Song of Moses was in fact um, alive in, in, in performance among the composers of the book. Okay, whom they had not come to know. This is the, the playful example that I mentioned. Um, 
And here's the verse in the Song of Moses. They sacrificed to spirits who were not divine. And this comes right after what we saw before. So they've eaten and they've, uh, they've forsaken Yahweh and they've turned to other gods, gods they had not come to know, new ones recently arrived, whom your fathers had not revered. And here in the second line is the phrasing that's that I'm focusing on, gods that they had not come to know. And technically the relative pronoun is not there in this verse in Hebrew. So I'm supplying it here in brackets. It will, it will appear in the other examples from elsewhere in the book. Let's see, this, this is a kind of a non-controversial example. Um, 29, 25 is one of the later parts, kind of one of the secondary frame, the secondary frame that I mentioned earlier. Um, so it wouldn't be so surprising that this, um, this wording would be found in this late addition to the book, if in fact the Song of Moses were itself a late addition to the book. But there's more. Chapters 11 and 13 are, again, among the earliest parts. 11 is still the introduction. 13 is right in the middle. Um, well, not in the middle technically, but you know the law code is well underway by this point in chapter 13. Um, and the same phrasing is here. Um, gods whom you have not come to know. Now let's see, there's, there's a bit more. There are several permutations of this phrasing. So here's, here's the critical verse again from the song. Um, I think that's a side that I should have deleted. Um, this, um, oh yeah, the phrasing, your fathers, which appears later in the verse. This is added in several examples um, as a clarification. Gods whom you have not come to know, neither you nor your fathers, your ancestors. Um, and so that's kind of, I guess, drawing more elements into these, these earlier examples. Another variation is that it's not gods that you have not known, but another nation that you have not known will do something um, bad. And so I think this comes from the idea that in the song, as the Israelites have abandoned their God, Yahweh, so Yahweh will abandon them and make them jealous with another nation or a non-nation, as it said. Um, so here we have that, that exact kind of thing happening. The people whom you have not come to know will consume the fruit of your ground and they will consume all of your labor and oppressed, oppressed and crushed is all that you will be. Um, a nation whom you have not come to know, neither you nor your fathers, Again, that clarification with your fathers. Um, okay, so this is this is the last of this this playful example, and it's. I guess it it proves the point that I want to make about, just the phrasing itself being adopted, because here, it is manna, which is the thing that you did not know before, the thing that you had not experienced or which your ancestors had not experienced. Um, but it functions differently in the narrative. So gods whom you do not know, did not know, that's negative. You shouldn't be worshiping them or a people that you did not ever know. Um, they shouldn't be taking over the benefits of the Israelites' relationship with their God, Yahweh. But here, manna is a gift from the Israelites' God. They're in the wilderness wandering. There's no food. And this new thing appears, manna, which they'd never experienced before. Now you could say that all of the food that, all of the rich food that the Israelites eat in the land is also a gift from their God, and it is certainly, um, but that uh, coincidence is not played with in the text. And a further, a yet further permutation is that um, the Israelites' kind of descendants are said to be ones who have not come to know um, the, the deeds, the beneficial deeds of Yahweh, the Israelites' God. The Israelites God. Um, and here again, these are 
positive people, you know, your own descendants, they haven't sinned yet, but they have to be taught um, to, to know the traditions of the Israelites and of the history of, of their relationship with their God. Also, your little ones whom you said will become prey and your sons who have not come to know as of today, good and evil, they're the ones who will enter into the land and to them I will give it and they will take possession of it. So there is a bit of a negative valence here. The Israelites of the current generation being addressed are the ones who have sinned and their descendants are the ones who will enter the land. And then it's these descendants who are actually the addressees of the book. And then finally, there's this um, situation that's speaking here. It's the topic. Um, this should be familiar to those of you who heard ages ago, my earlier, my only other um, interview in an open house um, when Claudia was interviewing me about my book, which had just come out. And I was going into, I guess, the other main part of my, my dissertation, which is how the Song of Moses is made up of a whole kind of symphony of voices speaking back and forth or adding to the same message. And you may recall from earlier slides, there was there were some awkward parts where the, the pronouns didn't match. Israel would be talked about in the third person, but then a voice would address the Israelites in the second person as you. Um, and I have an argument that this is, this represents antiphonal voices um, voices all speaking from the same perspective to convince the Israelites of whatever the current generation is um, of the importance of understanding their history and, and all of that and identifying with it emotionally. There are a couple of um, subparts here. So question and answer between ancestors and descendants. This happens in the song here and I've um, I've added highlighting here to show the layering of the voices so first here is the voice of the song itself or Moses if you want to say it's the song of Moses or even of the Israelite God Yahweh who he's not exactly shown composing the song but he just says here here's a song you should write it down so there's a question of of where it came from exactly and the idea um, in, I guess, real world, real world terms is that this song was always very well known among the Israelites. And Deuteronomy is appropriating it for its own purposes, its own theological purposes, saying, here's a song that we all know, we've all always known, but this is what it really means. In any case, the voice of the song here is speaking, and it says to the Israelites, ask your father that he may tell you, ask your elders that they may say it to you. And this is what this is what happens. Oh, I should I should go back for a second. And then when this quotation starts in verse eight, when the high one, this is I argue the answer to this asking, asking the father and asking the elders. This is the beginning of a new voice. And we see this kind of thing very clearly in chapter six. Um, and I've kept here the, the layering of the voices. So earlier on, Moses is beginning this of his uh, four speeches in the book of Deuteronomy. Some of them are very long. Um, so he begins speaking and he says, so when your son asks you in time to come, I'm saying these words. So this is exactly what the song of Moses has commanded the Israelites to do, to ask their father um, about days gone by. And then, this is what you shall say to your son. Um, and there's a story that begins with Egypt, which, interestingly enough, is not present at all in the Song of Moses. Um, and that is, I think, a very good reason that the Song of Moses is very old um, and not composed late or tacked on late to the very end, is that Egypt is a kind of omnipresent theme in the history of Israel, but somehow it's not mentioned at all in the song. And so if it were a product of, of later times, I can't imagine that there would be um, no mention of Egypt put in somehow. 
but that's a tangent for the moment. Um, and even something this, which is not exactly the same, but it's it's commanding a repetition of the words that Moses was commanding to the Israelites today, which is the day that they're about to cross the river of Jordan into the land. You shall repeat these words diligently to your sons and shall talk of them. And again, later in, in chapter 11, like I said, Deuteronomy is very repetitious. And so unfortunately my presentation has to be two, but it's not just that particular scenario of ancestors and um, descendants talking about the history of their people. There's a technique of um, what I'm calling advanced quotations that is also, I would say, borrowed from the song. And it, it does appear in earlier books, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Um, so you could make an argument that Deuteronomy is simply expanding on this technique, or the Song of Moses is also you know, borrowing it from earlier books. But even so, I think that you can say um, it's, it's in connection with the presence of the song in the book of Deuteronomy that this particular technique is found all over the place. And so there's something, something going on in this connection. So here in the song, we have the voice of the song again beginning. And it is quoting what God says, what Yahweh says. And this is in the future. God is talking about how he will, um, I guess, vindicate his people. The, the narrative is that um, the Israelites eat the rich fruit of the land. They abandoned Yahweh. Yahweh gets angry and punishes them with, um, by means of other peoples who um, defeat them militarily. But then Yahweh changes his mind and says, well, I need to then um, deal these other people's defeat so that people don't get the wrong impression. And so this is what's happening here. Um, and he's foreseeing this when I say, so here we have a, a, layered, a layered quotation and this thing is hypothetical speech. It's an anticipated speech. And this is, this is everywhere. I haven't highlighted these examples. And they're on all kinds of topics. Um, here, I said earlier that Deuteronomy has um, a disagreement, perhaps, or a difference from earlier laws insofar as it doesn't allow sacrifice in towns just anywhere. Um, so the problem is that people only eat meat when they make a sacrifice. And so how do you eat meat if you have to travel miles and miles to get to Jerusalem? So the slaughtering of animals is made, um, turned from a sacred act into a profane act. And Deuteronomy here is saying, you can eat meat whenever you want. Um, so when Yahweh your God extends your border as he spoke to you and you say, um, I will eat meat, just because your soul desires to eat meat, then you may eat meat upon any desire of your soul. Although I should say that there's, I guess, this theme of eating, which is also in common with the song. But I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Um, in chapter 15, there's a law about um, a Hebrew slave. Um, there's an institution of debt slavery um, where you could kind of sell yourself into the service of another another person to pay off your debts. And if at the end of the term of the service, um, this Israelite, um, your brother Israelite, so to speak, says to you, I will not go out from, from with you. Um, that's the situation here. But this is, this is um, expressed through this advanced quotation. And you could say, I mean, it could be phrased in other ways, you know, it could say, if he does not want to go out from, from with you, that would be fine. But it happens to use this particular form of expression. Um, it's used for the Israelites as a nation kind of saying, I will set a king over myself, like all the people surrounding me. Or, and this is in a, in a sermon about prophecy um, and what is true prophecy and what is false prophecy. So if the Israelites are asking themselves, how will we know the word that Yahweh has not spoken versus the other kind? Here's 
here's a law about how to go to battle and the things that you do to prepare for that. Um, when you are approaching the battle, the priest shall come near and speak to the people. He shall say to them, and here's a whole, um, a whole script for what the priest will say. Here, O Israel, you are approaching the battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted, do not be afraid or panic or tremble before them, for Yahweh your God is the one who goes with you um, to fight against your enemies to save you. But it's not just the priests, the officers also have a part to play. Um, there are certain exemptions. If you just built a house and haven't dedicated it, go home and, and dedicate your house. Um, if you planted a vineyard and have not harvested it from it yet, um, or if you are engaged but haven't gotten married yet, And then the officers have another another speech at um, at the end. Here's a ritual for, um, I guess, expiating um, an anonymous murder. Um, what happens is that a dead body is found in the countryside, and they measure to the closest town, and the closest town um, has to have its elders go through this. Um, ritual of um, breaking the neck the neck of a heifer and then they have to say this it was not our hands that shed this blood not our eyes that saw and so forth mm. this is a great one um, parents of a rebellious child they shall say to the elders of his city his being the father in this case this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious he doesn't listen to us. He is a glutton and a drunk. Um, okay, so that's maybe a dozen examples um, by comparison to a hand, maybe two or three in earlier books. Um, and there's one more specific kind of, a, of advanced quotation that is things to be avoided. So earlier we saw that these are kind of summaries of what you might be thinking. Um, and here are um, things that you shouldn't be thinking. And there's an example of this in the song as well. Um, the song is speaking and quoting Yahweh, and he is quoting something that he does not want the enemies of Israel to say, um, and that is to take credit for their military defeat of the Israelites. It needs to be clear that Yahweh is the one who authorized them or empowered them to defeat his people, you know, not, not themselves. It's not a case of our hand is exalted. It was not Yahweh who accomplished all this. And so he changes the course of events and he decides, as we saw earlier, to um, deal defeat to those enemies in turn. This is uh, upon entrance into the land. If you say in your heart, this is the nation of Israel, so much more numerous are these nations than I am. How will I be able to dispossess them? Well, the antidote is that you shall not fear them. And recall what your God did for you um, to Egypt and to um, the Pharaoh. This is a similar example. Um, the Anakim are a particular subset of the inhabitants of the land. They have a reputation for being um, formidable, I guess you could say, in battle. Um, and so the saying is, um, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't think that if you're an Israelite about to cross into the lands, because it's Yahweh, your God, who was the one crossing over before you. So these passages give both the, the kind of mental speech to be avoided and also the antidote. Let's see. Here in chapter 9, Moses is trying to convince Yahweh not to destroy the Israelites. Um, and this itself was a situation similar to what we can see in the song, where God has become angry with the Israelites for abandoning him um, and decides to destroy them. And in this case, Moses is arguing him out of it. And he says, well, what will the Egyptians think? And this matches the very example that we saw from the song, you know, lest the adversaries misconstrue unless they say, 
um, you know, we're the ones who have the power, not Yahweh. And, and so here too, um, Yahweh does not want to contemplate um, the Egyptians saying this, that he, has, that he um, cannot bring them into the land, that he, cannot, that he hates them, and therefore is just going to kill them in the wilderness. The Israelites should not uh, ask themselves, well, how, how did these other nations serve their gods? I will do the same. And I see that I forgot to include the antidote here in this case. Chapter 13 gives all kinds of examples of how you might be led astray as an ancient Israelite to worship other gods, which is again, the main concern of the Song of Moses. So if a prophet or a dreamer of prophetic dreams promises you a miracle and it comes true, and the message of this miracle was supposed to be, well, this shows us that we should go after other gods and worship them, gods whom you have not come to know. This is a verse that I showed you before in connection with this, this phrasing. Um, well, the solution is to understand that God is, um, your God is testing you to know whether you love him completely. Or a few verses later, um, or actually the very next verses, if someone who's very close to you says the same thing, let's serve other gods that we haven't known before. Um, you shall not yield to him, you shall not listen to him for you should understand he is seeking to drive you away from Yahweh your God. And one more, um, this is anywhere, this is not, not prophets, not religious figures, um, not your intimate circles, but just kind of anyone um, in, at large in the population. If you hear about one of your cities, which Yahweh your God is giving you to live there, um, if you hear these words, some worthless fellows have gone out from among you and have driven away the inhabitants of their city driven them from Yahweh, is the point here, with these words, let us go and serve other gods whom you have not come to know. Then you shall seek and search and ask well. And if it turns out that the matter is true and established, that this ab abomination was done among you, you shall surely strike the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying her. So the antidote here is a, not a kind of mental understanding of, of why you shouldn't serve other gods, but an, an action that you should do to cut off the possibility entirely. Mm, let's see. Here's one that has to do with debt and you know loans of money. Um, so every seven years, there's to be a, a forgiveness of debts in general. And if you're an ancient Israelite and your poor fellow Israelite comes to you and asks for a loan, out of, out of needing something, you shouldn't say, oh, it's almost the seventh year, um, the year of a mission, and, and you don't give the loan. Um, you know, that's something that you should not do. Um, you should recall that God will bless you, in fact, for being generous when, when you can't uh, get a return. Here too is another example of people. Uh, hmm. Well, I guess it's not it's not of um, individuals trying to incite others to turn away from God, but a kind of internal convincing of, of oneself. I don't need to follow God in this case because I'm exempt somehow. I can make no distinction. This phrase at the end here. So the, the quote is: "I will have peace." proceeding in the stubbornness of my heart in order to sweep away the moist and the dry. It's not quite clear what this means, but um, the general idea is this person doesn't need to make distinctions between right and wrong. They can proceed in, in their stubborn ways. Um, but in fact, Yahweh will not be willing to forgive this person. And one final one. Um, this whole law that Moses is giving on this day, um, it's not too miraculous for you to do, nor is it far off. 
it's not in the skies that you should think who shall ascend to the skies for us and get it for us and make us hear it that we may do it nor is it across the sea such that you should say or think who shall cross over the sea for us and get it for us and make us hear it that we may do it but the antidote here is that you should realize the word is very near to you in your mouth and this is what the the song of or where the song of moses is yahweh commands moses to put the song to write the song and to put it in the mouth of the Israelites. And I take this as an indication of the ongoing performance tradition of, of the song. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. There's also this metaphor of writing, not just on a scroll that gets put into the Ark of the Covenant, but uh, on the heart. Okay, so here's Deuteronomy again, with a song at the bottom and it's, few verses of, of framing. Um, hmm. The screen is not very easy to see, but here um, are the examples that have to do with um, eating and being satisfied and turning away from God in, in the earlier chapters. A few more, well, they are kind of hard to see, so I'll just go through all of these and say that um, they're found everywhere, basically, these kinds of things. And I've only given you maybe half of the kinds of things that I've found. Um, so that, uh, you know, I didn't write a great conclusion, so I'll just stop here and, um, and turn it back over to Sarah to moderate. And I will finally stop presenting and uh, let my face be seen. Thanks for clapping. I can see it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Uh, that that's uh, really a very um, detailed um, look at at an overview or an overview look at a lot of detail, which is it's really fascinating. Um, and uh, the the way those uh, themes are threaded through the whole the whole book. Um, so uh, before I open it to the participants here, in, as it were, in the room, uh, we do actually have a comment or question in through our YouTube channel, viewer, uh, about one of the, the themes that you were talking about, um, with whom you, have not, whom you have not come to know, or whom they have not come to know. And mm -hmm. the question is about uh, a, a, a hero's ex call vocab term, napios. Um, and oh, is this phrase about the idea of disconnection, does that have any similarity with that, uh, that concept, do you think? Hmm. That's really interesting. In the context of Deuteronomy, I think you could say that it does, because there's such an emphasis on being connected to one's ancestors, not in the hero called way, but um, in the sense of tradition being passed on and the knowledge about um, divine actions, you know, benefiting the people. Um, this is the important thing to pass on. And so this, this kind of, it's important that this chain be unbroken of ancestor passing on to descendant, um, the content of tradition. Um, hmm, that's interesting. I have to see more about that word, um, but in general, or. I guess more largely no. Um, this is just the verb to know. Um, it's the verb that gives us, you know, knowing in the biblical sense in those contexts, um, um, just knowing any kind of old fact, or in this case, um, kind of historical experience. Um, there's Yahweh, whom you do have historical experience with, and then these other gods who haven't really done anything for you yet, you know, they haven't rescued you from Egypt or brought you into this land or, or that kind of thing. It's a really interesting question. Thank you to whoever, whoever asked that one. Thank you. Um, so uh, anybody in the room put their hand up? I think I see Maria. Go ahead. Um, may I speak? Yes. Yes. Well, I think my, my question is complementary to one to the question before. Uh, one thing that I would like you to illustrate for us is this particular phrase, uh, the, uh, whom you or have not come to know. Um, 
in what sense Yahweh, um, yeah, uh, in a way, articulates his precedence in that way? For example, he is not presented as the one true God, as far as I can understand, like I am the one and only God. But uh, I mean, that does he? Yahweh leaves uh, room in that sense that there may be other gods, which I don't assume this is the case. But if if Yahweh leaves room for other gods, so how this is related to he, to His onlyness, the the one true God, which is of course related to the Ten Commandments and then the six uh, six hundred thirteen commandments that one should keep in order, you know, to practice Judaism. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It's complicated. Um, Deuteronomy is um, maybe ground zero for this kind of. Um, theological discussion and, and development um, in the Bible. Um, there is, let's see, so certainly by talking about other gods, by saying, well, the Israelites turned from me to worship these other gods, that already assumes or even just says there are other divinities. Um, elsewhere in the song, the voice of Yahweh says, well, they weren't, or no, it's the voice of, of the elders and, and the song itself that say, well, these weren't really gods. They were just kind of demons or other spirits. So a kind of demotion. Um, and at one point, the figure of God says, well, they, they made me jealous with these things that were no, not God. So I'll make them jealous with something that is not a people. Um, Well, there's a, you know, something behind that that I, that I won't talk about now. Um, later in the song, it's really interesting. He says, um, as he's promising, um, raising his hands, you know, he says, when I say, I, um, I raise my hand to the sky, um, he says, I am he, I'm the only one. What that means in context, though, is I'm the one who um, causes injury, you know, from whom no one um, can rescue. Um, he's the one who's in control, not not the only one. This becomes in Isaiah, which I think borrows this phrasing, a statement of kind of monotheism. But in this case, no, there's a part in the song where the elders start talking. Um, I said, I pointed out this part where the song commands the Israelites to ask their father, ask their elders, so that they can learn. Um, and what begins there is an account of how Israel came to be as a people. So when the Most High, whoever this is, was giving, making the nations inheritances for particular gods, um, it turned out that um, Israel was the portion of Yahweh. So is the Most High the same as Yahweh or, or not? Is he a kind of a subordinate? in this case, who eventually proves his superiority in, in some way. And there's some of that kind of thing in the Psalms, particularly Psalm 82. Um, there is in this in those couple of verses a part where it says that the Most High um, set up the boundaries, made, made these divisions between peoples and gods according to the number of and in the Hebrew, it says, according to the number of the sons of the Israelites, or the sons of Israel, the Israelites. Um, but there are other texts. The Greek text um, here says, according to the number of the sons of God, um, there is found at the Dead Sea a, a fragmentary scroll that has the reading according to the sons, and it has the first two letters of what could be God. So it seems likely that this was changed for theological reasons. Um, as the poem was, um, I mean, it, it remained a classic, so that's one reason why you need to update it um, so that it, it reflects um, correct theology. Um, but elsewhere in the book of Deuteronomy, um, it assumes that there, are, it still assumes that there are other gods um, that are allotted to other nations, but not to the Israelites. 
Does that answer? I know it answers yes, some of yes, your questions. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yes uh, thank you. Especially um, your, your last uh, uh, sentence um, prompts me if uh, Sarah, our moderator, allows me to, to, to ask a second question. Um, so, uh, uh, in that sense, as you rightly pointed out, uh, Yahweh and Israel have uh, uh, a kind of an uh, almost, I would say, in interactive relation. In, in what sense? The faith of Israel is fed on its relation on Yahweh and also Yahweh relations towards Israel. Um, is also uh, based on Israel as his portion, his uh, um, chosen, am I allowed to say, his chosen uh, portion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't can know we, if, can we say that? if uh, oh, sorry, did you want to add to that? Yes, yes, oh. this, this, yes. This, this was my question. I mean, okay. can, we, okay. can we, in a way, see that as, a, as an interactive, uh, uh, as a special relation between the, the two? Yes, definitely. Um, I don't know if choosing would be quite the right word. Um, in the song, like I said, there's this idea that um, another, more superior God was making the divisions. But if you decide that the Most High God and Yahweh are the same, then it is Yahweh's choice to have the Israelites as his own particular people. Um, and that would explain some of the language elsewhere in the book of Deuteronomy, or that understanding of the song would explain language elsewhere that says um, that the Israelites are, well, preferred, they are, it's interesting because because Yahweh says, "I didn't choose you because you were such a great, you know, multi, um, numerous people or obedient people. In fact, you're not very obedient. You're you're small, and but you know, I loved your ancestors, and and that's it. And also, these other nations were wicked, so I, I'm driving them out, and I'm putting you there, not because you're righteous, but just because they're wicked." Um, so there's a diminishing of a special relationship, or there's a negative valence given to the to the special relationship. Um, but there are other parts where it says, um, "Other nations will hear of the of this law that I'm commanding you today." This is Moses talking, um, and say, "Wow, what a what a great and wise people this is." And I don't have the wording quite right. Um, and it comes out of this special relationship. And there's, there's something else that I can't remember at all the wording of, but there is this idea of, of Israel's superiority or at least hierarchical superiority to other nations in connection with um, Yahweh's eventual, at least, superiority in terms of theological development. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone? Uh, Georgia? Ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Keith, very much for the presentation. Um, mm -hmm. You said, uh, going back to the place of the Song of Moses in the Deuteronomy, um, you said that uh, actually the place uh, at the end, um, it, it should not, let's say, convince us about the chronological, let's say, composition of the song, but uh, it's about uh, using, the, uh, it's, it's about the use of the song um, in the context of Deuteronomy, uh, as a uh, as an act of interpretation, as an act of ut uh, utilizing it for its uh, purposes. So, um, uh, you obviously uh, think that there is a function of the song within the context of Deuteronomy, and uh, my question is, how would it be without it? What would it have lost? And connection to that mm -hmm. by means of a Pharisees, and. Um, if we suppose, as you very nicely with your paradigms displayed, um, the connection of the Song of Moses or the existence, the pre existence of the Song of Moses as a song of heart, um, by recalling it, by recalling such a song of heart which pre exists, can we just suppose that this is a kind of a subtle and then again not very subtle admonition and uh, reference to the 
to an earlier age and a kind of criticism of a certain current state of affairs. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. That's exactly right. Um, I didn't um, say this in my all too brief introduction or orientation to Deuteronomy, but it is written around the time of the destruction of the land. So I guess I maybe alluded to this, um, but it's set in the far past. Um, so in this way, there's an, an analogy to what we see in, in the hero's material that we're all familiar with, where the present, the ritual present, um, makes its way into stories about the past. So Achilles supervises funeral games for Patroclus. Well, in the present, he's a ghostly patron of funeral games for himself and Patroclus. Um, and in this case, too, Moses is, um, he makes a story about Moses, but it has relevance to current, um, current events, current concerns. Um, and it, it definitely is a criticism. It says, you know, it's phrased in, in the, in, um, as anticipation, you know, so Moses in the past and Yahweh in the past say, oh, I know that you Israelites are stubborn and are going to misbehave and I'm going to get angry um, and destroy you or almost destroy you in the, this kind of thing. Um, but this has already happened in the kind of present of the storytelling of Deuteronomy. The audience, um, the first audience of Deuteronomy has experienced this destruction firsthand. Um, and so it's both a criticism and also a kind of in the, um, strategy for enabling um, positive results in the future. The earlier versions of, of law would just say, this is what you need to do. This is, this is a very simplified way of saying it. But Deuteronomy says, not only are these things you should do, but here's how you do it. You need to fear God. You need to um, not forget God. You need to remember what he did for us, you know, rescuing us from Egypt. Um, so these, these mental states that need to proceed or um, enable obedience. Um, so it has, it has a positive as well. And ultimately there are passages that say that, um, that Yahweh will redeem his people and bring them back to the land and all of that. Um, let's see, I think that's the second part, part of your question. Uh, could you remind me of the first? Am I remembering this right? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, the first was because you said actually they bring it back or they uh, uh, put it in, or it, the Deuteronomy has it, the Song of Moses as in terms of um, explaining what it means. So they just don't compose it ad hoc, but in a way they, they uh, bring it I to agree. memory. So by means of a Pharisees, what would it, uh, the Deuteronomy have lost if the Song of Moses wouldn't exist? Yeah. Wow. I mean, in a way, it wouldn't lose anything because its its themes are all over the book. Um, it would lose, I think, its oomph. It would lose its. I mean, this is the book that includes the famous song that we all know, or one of the dozen or so that we all know, to judge by the poems that are included in the Bible. Um, so it lose lose just the prestige of the song, I guess you could say. Um, but not, not a lot of its message. And it's not from the Song of Moses that anyone in the Gospels quotes, I think. Paul quotes from the Song of Moses quite a bit. He says things like, vengeance is mine, it says the Lord. That's from the Song of Moses. Um, and other things, I think, in the Book of Romans. But yeah, I don't think the Pharisees, for example. So if it, if it just uh, just a remark, so if it doesn't lose much by by not being there in a way, because it has a very strategic uh, position, you know, as you very nicely displayed, you know, the outline, the framework, it's a very strategic. So in a way, if it doesn't, it doesn't, yeah, I don't know, the, the Deuteronomy doesn't lose in, uh, let's say, value or merit if it does not exist there, its prime position in a way, should be could be used as an argument that it was actually it was already there, and it was just let's say reput was rep, was uh, repositioned there in in the hearts or in the, you know 
because otherwise, as a strategic mm -hmm. uh, position, what would uh, imagine that we need something extra? Because we use the strategic position to say something uh, very important as well. Mm -hmm. But it just isn't. There is an idea that um, the Ten Commandments and the Song of Moses kind of frame the book of Deuteronomy. So there's the, the law code in the middle, and then the two other, these two, two other texts, the Ten Commandments and the Song of Moses at other, at other end. Um, and so it could be part of just a framing device that way, that we're going to bookend our reinterpretation of the law with a couple of famous texts that have to do with the law. And, and so that's some, hmm. I'll have to think more about that. Maybe I'll have to ask you to write that down, actually, for further thought. Thank you. Well, um, unfortunately, we're kind of out of time. So uh, I'm sure we'll be continuing to think about uh, the, these themes and these quotations, and it will help us look in more detail at these texts as, as, we're, as we're reading further. Um, so um, unfortunately, we'll have to wrap it up. But thank you so much, Keith, for being our guest and for mm -hmm. answering questions and, and for you. sharing this presentation. It's been great. Yeah, it's nice to be on this side. For, you know. Thanks. <laughs>